Hi, everyone. It's very bright here, so I can't actually see you, which is going to make this even more interesting. Um, so I'm here today to give a technical talk about something that I'm really deeply passionate about, which is inclusive user experiences through a lens of web performance. And I hope that by the end of this talk, you will have a lot of strategies to improve the performance of products that you're working on and build a greater, more inclusive web. So let's get started. So the internet is growing exponentially, but I think so often we fail to reflect that the greater picture of connectivity is not as good as we think it would be. And the context that our audience is finding themselves in is not really the context of our experience. And even at a short glance at the World Wide Web, it's quite easy to spot that we haven't been building the web with empathy and with situation variability awareness and performance in mind. But what am I basing those statements on? Let's have a look at the state of performance and the web and connectivity today. 51% of 7.4 billion people on this planet have the access to the internet, which if you ask me, that's not enough. That's such a low number. Only 51%. The average network speed caps at very unimpressive 7 megs a second. And even more importantly, 93% of internet users go online through a mobile device. So it becomes inexcusable to not to cater to handheld devices. And when you look at things like the cost of data, it's actually much more expensive for some people than you might think. A 500 megabyte packet of data might cost anywhere between an hour or 13 hours of work on a minimum wage, and that's an example between Brazil and Germany. And if you're interested in how much data costs, I would strongly recommend reading Beyond the Bubble, Real Work Performance by um, Ben Schwartz, who did a lot of research into the cost of data, and you will find some very interesting findings there. And our websites and products aren't better either. The average site size right now is three megabytes, which is the original size of Doom game. To me, that's just mind-blowing. And while averages can hide some data for us, and statistically, they aren't necessarily very accurate, and if we look at medians in performance, the, aver the median size is actually 1.4 megabytes still. That's quite a bit of data that we're sending to um, the people who are visiting our sites and our products as well. Images can easily be 1.7 megabytes in bandwidth. JavaScript, 400 kilobytes. And this isn't a problem that's only specific to the web platform. It's actually happening in native applications as well. When was the last time that you downloaded 700 megabytes of app updates in App Store just in one day? or 200 megabytes of unspecified bug fixes for an app that you have on your phone. I think we can actually do better than that. I strongly feel that as technologists, we often find ourselves in the position of privilege. With up-to-date devices, high-end laptops, incredibly fast internet connection, and way above average salaries, we forget that this isn't the case for everyone is actually the case for very few people on this planet. But the privilege that we have clouds that for us. If we are building the web platform from the standpoint of lack of empathy and that privilege, it will result in design and developing exclusionary support experiences. So what I want to talk about today is how can we do better as designers, developers, product managers, or whatever your title might be, through the lens of web performance. And what I would like to start with is working on optimizing all assets. So strategies that can apply to no matter what type of assets you're using. And I strongly believe that one of the most powerful ways to improve performance in a significant way starts with understanding how the browsers work. And now that's not an easy task. Um, I think we can at least have a glance at 
how it happens and how we can affect it in a positive way performance-wise. So it turns out that browsers are pretty great at discovering resources, parsing, and determining their priority on the fly. They're pretty great at it. So to show you a, quite a big simplification, but I think it still portrays the point pretty well, this is how um, a browser fetches a website. So the HTML is discovered, that usually happens first, shortly after there's CSS, and depending on whether you're loading your scripts asynchronously, synchronously, or deferring them, sometimes alongside CSS, JavaScript appears. And then, time for web fonts. But Web fonts are quite tricky because they only will be discovered when a DOM element is found with matching style reference to that web font. So web fonts come quite later in the process. So you can see that this is pretty waterfully process, and there are way more intricacies to how assets are being fetched and what the priorities are, and I'm not going to go into that because that could be literally a separate talk. But for the purpose of explaining some performance strategies, I think this will do it the job. So here is where one of the quite new strategies comes in, called the critical request. And a request is critical when it contains assets that are necessary to render the content within the user's viewport. And luckily enough, now, we are able to control this behavior through setting priority on crucial resources. But what are crucial resources? How the heck am I supposed to know? Well, let, let's look at the example of the front end conference Zurich website. Obviously, we need the HTML and CSS. That's quite obvious. There's a lead image that we need, there's a logo, and there is a web font. So we should mark those assets are crucial. How do we do that? With link rel preload, we're able to set the priority of those assets to high. So the browser will always fetch them immediately if it sees link rel preload, which I think is a pretty powerful strategy. And the as attribute will ensure the right priority, content security policies, and setting the right accept headers. And this technique, it looks fairly simple, but it's extremely powerful, and it can yield significant performance improvements to time to interactive metric, which really reflects the perceived user experience. And if you would like to know more about the critical requests and how it works and how to implement it in the best way, I strongly recommend the critical request article on CSS tricks, which goes in depth of the strategy, and it will be very helpful if you would like to implement that approach. Additionally, there's a great article by Adios Mani, I think it was entitled Preload, Prefetch, and Priorities in Chrome, that goes in great detail on how Chrome does it specifically. And to track how well you're doing in enable priorities, in, you can you do it in Chrome um, by opening DevTools, um, going into the Network tab, uh, selecting the headings, right-click, enable the priority column, and bam, you have it, and you can see that some resources are priorities are highest, high, low, lowest, um, or medium. Um, and you can audit this behavior in Lighthouse, a performance tool that has a, an audit called critical request chains, uh, which will make, make it more easy to understand how the priorities are working. So, of course, there are many other strategies to apply to all of the assets. This is only one of them. Um, but I thought it's, it's such a new thing in the development world and it's so, um, and can be so useful to shaving several seconds off um, the, the performance of your, of your websites and products that I've, I've felt inclined to share only that one practice in this particular section. Of course, if we were about to talk about performance checklists, um, there are more things that you could do, which is aggressive caching, enabling server-side compression, um, the critical requests, which means the critical assets, and using content delivery networks. Um, and these three things basically ensure that the performance of all of your assets um, most likely will be great. So let's go a little bit deeper and talk about one of the biggest performance of renders, which are images. So images m mostly account for most of the web's um, pages transferred payload, um, which is why you can usually have the biggest performance savings in that area. But how the heck do I pick the right format? There are so many out of them. But I think before we go into that decision making, it's really important to stop for a second and think, well, is this image actually essential to 
conveying the message that I'm trying to show to my users. Because sometimes, it's actually, it's not. Maybe it's actually feasible for us to eliminate it. Or maybe it's actually possible to achieve similar results with CSS. CSS is really powerful these days, and it offers many art direction features, like gradients, shadows, animation, uh, drawing shapes. So you can style a DOM element to actually not use an image. But you have to stop for a second and think, is this image actually necessary? But let's say, sure, we actually have to have this image. We, there's no way around it, we have to have it. So if it's not possible, the initial choice falls between vector and raster graphics. Um, and if we're choosing vector graphics, they are usually resolution independent, very small in size, they're perfect for logo types, um, icons, and very simple assets that comprise of simple shapes like polygons, circles, points, or lines. Alternatively, we have a choice of raster imagery, which is perfect for photos because it offers much more detailed imagery and results. So let's say I definitely need a raster image. Well, it's not getting any easier for me because now I have to pick between JPEGs, PNG8, PNG24, GIFs, or videos. And how do I make that choice? Of course, this slide is a simplification of the choice and the intricacies of those choices, but I think it's a pretty good way to start thinking about that. So JPEGs are great for many colors, which means usually photography. PNG is for um, imagery of few colors, uh, PNG24, anything with transparency, GIFs for animated imagery, and sometimes we can swap GIFs for videos, which are more lightweight, and we can basically have the same effect. So that's a um, simple way of determining what kind of format I should be using for my imagery. But what's really important is that Photoshop can optimize each of those assets and export them through various settings. We can reduce noise, we can reduce quality, we can reduce number of colors. But who does that? Designers. So I think ensuring that designers know about the performance footprint and best practices is really important. And I think we can coach designers how to export those assets properly and how to develop images and how to pick the formats. Now, um, there are a few um, image formats that are quite new, uh, namely WebP, JPEG 2000, and JPEG XR. Um, all of them were developed by browser vendors. WebP by Google, JPEG 2000 by Apple, and JPEG XR by Microsoft. But I really want to talk about WebP today. WebP is one of the most popular contenders um, because it supports both lossless and lossy compression, which makes it extremely versatile. And if I recall correctly, WebP is 26% smaller than PNGs, 25 to 34% smaller than JPEGs, which is quite huge. And with the 74% browser support, it's really a viable option for anyone. You can use it without a fallback or with a fallback, depending on what your browser support is like. But it can yield up to one third savings in transferred bytes. So it's something really wor worth looking into. And you can change, you can export JPEGs and change JPEGs and PNGs um, to web piece in Photoshop, but not Creative Cloud. Um, there is an extension that works with older versions of Photoshop. It works natively in Pixelmator. And alternatively, you can run brew install WebP and do it in command line. But even using those really efficient image formats doesn't really mean that we can skip post-processing and we can skip the optimization step, because that step is really important. So if you choose an SVG, there's a tool called SVGO, uh, which is an interface tool and a command line based tool that will strip unnecessary metadata from SVGs. And if you are not on a Mac or you prefer a web-based interface, Jake Archibald built SVGOMG, which is a great tool that you can, um, the space of SVGO. Alternatively, if you are using raster images, um, Image Optim is an amazing bundle of open source algorithms for image compression in one app. It's a macOS app, command line interface, sketch plugin, and probably more options. Uh, so it's very versatile and it's very accessible to use. And if you are not on a Mac, if you're on Linux of, of, or Windows, all of the tools that are bundled in Image Optim, you can use them on command line. So Image Optim is built on Zopfly, PNGQuant, MozJPEG, PNGCrush, 
and many others. So it's probably the most comprehensive optimization bundle that you can use. But what's really important when you're choosing those tools is that you should be embedding them in your existing processes and workflows to make sure that none of the imagery that you're adding to your product are slipping through the cracks unoptimized. So we talked about WebP, which let's say it's a little bit bleeding edge, but if you're willing to try something experimental, uh, earlier this year Google released Getsly, which is an algorithm that's based on their learnings in WebP and Zopfly algorithm. Uh, that can produce up to 35% smaller JPEGs, which to me is quite huge. Unfortunately, it comes with a downside of the time that it takes to process images, which I think is approximately a minute per megapixel, so it can be quite slow. So we've chosen our format, and we've chosen the right type of asset, and I think we're done. We can just slap it on the side, our job here is done. Well, the little we knew. A decade ago, it might have been okay. We just paste an image tag, there's an image there, it renders with the right resolution, everything is fine. But long gone are the days of fixed designs, and we're in the world of responsive design and many devices and many viewports. So we have to take extra care in implementing the imagery that we want. Thankfully, through tireless work of the responsive images community group, we are perfectly equipped to create responsive imagery in development phase through the picture element and the sources attribute. So let's go through them briefly. The source attribute is really best for the resolution switching scenario. So when we want to display imagery based on a set of conditions such like density or viewport size, it creates a set of predefined rules and it will browser will pick the best image suitable for this scenario, which not only creates bandwidth savings, but also request savings. So it's a great strategy for mobile audiences especially. The picture element is slightly different. It was created with a goal of art direction. So the syntax is slightly similar, but what it does is that based on the conditions tested through media queries, um, we can serve different type of imagery based on different types of devices. So say we will serve a large landscape photo for a device that's a laptop because there's a lot of screen estate to fill. But on a mobile, it wouldn't make sense because the image would be cropped. So maybe instead of actually constraining the image, we'd like to serve only the part of the image, which is where the picture element comes. And if you're interested in both picture element and source set, I strongly recommend reading Jason Scrid's B Responsive Imagery 101, which is an incredibly in-depth article writing about both of those approaches. Now I've mentioned CDNs in the first part of the talk, and CDNs are great for any type of the asset, but I think they can be incredibly powerful, especially for imagery. And CDNs such as Cloudinary or ImageX can take a lot of complexity out of serving responsive images. They can not only decrease response latency because they're closer to users and reduce traffic on your servers, they can also do face detection. They can crop images. They can serve appropriate file types to appropriate browsers and devices. They can watermark. They can alter images and create filters on the fly. That's really powerful. So if you're working on an image-heavy project, image-heavy product, it's really worth it to look into image CDNs and leverage them to serve the best imagery possible. So if we were to have a performance checklist for imagery, this would probably be it. Choose the right format, use vector whenever possible, reduce the quality if the change is unnoticeable, and trust me, oftentimes it is. Experiment with new formats, such as WebP. Optimize with tools and algorithms like SVGO or Image Optim. Learn about source it and picture, and use an image CDN if it's available um, for your product and it's, a, um, it's something that you should be looking into. So let's move to another performance offender, which is web fonts. So the ability to use custom, custom web fonts is really great. It's an ex extremely powerful design tool. 68% of websites use web fonts. That's just mind-blowing. But what we fail to 
reflect on is that easily a web font could be 100 kilobytes, 300 kilobytes, 500 kilobytes, depending on the number of typefaces, the depending on the num number of variants. So oftentimes, this is what happens. So even when the weight of the web font isn't the biggest problem, isn't the biggest performance offender, the flash of invisible content is. And a flash of invisible content happens where fonts are failed to be fetched, or they're still loading because your network is slow or your device is slow. So again, it might be worth it to pose the question, is it really worth it for me to have web fonts? Is this necessary for my project? Is it necessary for my design? Is this necessary for my goals? Is this going to prevent my users from accessing the content? Because sometimes we are better off with using system fonts. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we are really wanting to use web fonts, fortunately, we have quite a few strategies to do so in a really performant way. So let's talk about formats again. There are four web font formats. EOT, TDF, WAF, and WAF2. And I would really like to focus on WAF2. Most likely, you're better off using WAF2, maybe with fallback of WAF, because they both have 90% browser support. And the reason why WAF2 is so great is because the files are 30% smaller and they have improved parsing capabilities. And that's because Google developed WAF2 and they've learned a lot through their other compression algorithms and they embedded that work in WAF2. So if you're using web fonts, WAF2 and WAF are probably your best choices. Unless you're supporting very legacy browsers, then probably you have to look into other formats as well. What's important to remember is to hint the format when we are defi defining font face. So always include the format declaration when you're defining your font face rules. If you're using hosted solutions such as Google Web Fonts or Typekit, um, both of these tools have quite amazing performance-oriented strategies. So Typekit now is serving all of their JavaScript kit code asynchronously, which doesn't really block rendering of the fonts. It also allows for an extended period of caching of their kit code for, of 10 days, not 10 minutes as it was before. Google Fonts automatically will serve the smallest size possible for the device that it detects. So these are all really great strategies for hosted tools that we might be using. But it also boils down again to limiting the amount of typefaces and the amount of variants that we are using. Ideally, in an ideal scenario, we would be using one typeface and two variants, normal and bold. That usually caters to most use cases. But sometimes we see products that have free web fonts with three different variants and that becomes really performance heavy. So if you're not sure, just stop for a minute and think, are all of these typefaces actually necessary? Are all of those font weights actually necessary? Because maybe I can get away and not use them and shave 100 kilobytes easily. Another web font oriented strategy is something called Unicode range subsetting. And it's not necessarily something that will apply to all of us, but in some cases, it can, it can be incredibly powerful, especially if you are targeting Asian languages that can average 20,000 glyphs, which is quite a big number. Um, Unicode range set subsetting allows splitting large sets of web fonts into smaller sets. So you're basically saying, I'm not going to use this entire set. I'm only going to use letters A through F, because these are the ones that I need. And the first step to do so is usually to limit the language of the font. So pick Latin or Greek or Cyrillic. And if the web font is only used, for example, in the logotype, which is sometimes the case, and the rest is just fonts that are available on the system, we shouldn't be including the entire web font file. We should only pick the number of characters that we need, subset, and serve that to the user. This is a pretty advanced technique, but fortunately, thanks to the Filament group, they've released an open source module called Glyph Hanger that will analyze, based on URLs provided to it, a list of, and provide you a list of necessary characters that you will need for subsetting. Alternatively, you can use um, Font Squirrel. They have a, quite an advanced web font generator that has subsetting options and our optimization options. Um, 
if you're using Google Fonts or Typekit, uh, choosing a language subset is, is really trivial. It's there in, the, in their editor. It's built in their interface. Um, so you should always uh, make sure that you take the right languages that you are trying to support. What's really important to remember is that fonts are render blocking. And that often causes the flush of invisible text, which we've seen on the screenshot before. And that's because the browser has to build the DOM and build the CSS on first before a matching CSS selector for a DOM that needs a, for a DOM element that needs a web font is found. And that effect is even more pronounced of slow network and mobile devices. So how do we how do we prevent it from happening when we really need a web font? Well, we need a font loading strategy. And as of recently, there is a new property called Font Display that will allow us to provide a fallback for our web fonts while they're being fetched. And this is a pure CSS solution which will be extremely powerful for con controlling the content and making sure that people can access your content while the web font is being loaded. Unfortunately, Font Display is still under development in Firefox and Safari. It's only available in Chrome and Opera, but still, you can use it today with other font loading strategies that aren't CSS only. And speaking of other font loading strategies, there are two extremely interesting and valuable projects, Typekit's Web Font Loader and Bramstein's Font Face Observer, that will let you control the display of web fonts through JavaScript. And an amazing um, web typography and performance expert, Zach Letterman, wrote an amazing article, a, compre a comprehensive guide to font loading strategies. That was hard. Um, that will help you with choosing the right font loading strategy suitable for your project. And this is how it looks in action. So it's flash and unstyled text, that's just a system font. This is my personal website, just playing with it. Um, and a web font. So the time, of course, I should fix that little flash, but still, the font loading strategy is really effective because there's no time when there's no content for the user to interact with. So our performance checklist for typography and web fonts are choosing the right format, auditing the font selection, do I need that many typefaces, do I, do I need that many variants, using Unicode range subsetting if it's relevant to my use case, and very carefully because when you're subsetting, you can easily lose some characters, and that really can produce some jarring effects. And establishing a font loading strategy, whether it's CSS-based with font display or JavaScript-based. So let's talk about our sweetheart JavaScript, which is my favorite. Um, so at the moment, the average size of JavaScript bundle is 400, 446 kilobytes, which you might say, eh, that's, that's fine. But um, what we might not realize is that there is a much more sinister performance bottleneck hidden behind our beloved JavaScript. And that's something called parse and compile. So optimizing delivery is only one step. After JavaScript is being downloaded, it has to be parsed, compiled, and run by the browser. And a quick look at a few popular sites shows that it has become two to three times bigger after unpacking. So effectively, we're sending giant blobs of JavaScript down the wire. So analyzing parse and compile times becomes really crucial to understanding when apps are becoming interactive and ready for people to interact with. And these timings can vary significantly on, based on hardware capabilities, based on user's device. It really depends. So without analyzing that, we can't know. Accordingly to Adia's Manus research, parse and compile times can be two to five times higher on lower end mobile devices. An average JavaScript based app will take 16 seconds to load and become interactive on mobile. Eight seconds on desktop. Eight seconds. That's just inexcusable. Fortunately, we can look at parse and compile times in Chrome DevTools to better understand what's happening under the hood. 
And that happens through going to the Performance tab, hitting the Reload button, and then we can see how much time is spent on scripting. This is Twitter.com, four seconds on scripting. Just scripting, just JavaScript. Another thing that JavaScript does pretty well is package managers. And package man managers can easily obscure the size and depth of our dependencies. And I think we've all heard the jokes about that. Fortunately, there are a few tools that are extremely helpful with determining how can we get rid of unnecessary dependencies, dependencies that are included a few times, merging dependencies, or dependencies that are too big. And those tools are uh, Bundle Buddy by Samsecon and Webpack Bundle Analyzer, which is portrayed here, that we can install and analyze our bundle and visually assess what's unnecessary and where are the biggest performance offenders. But whenever possible, we should only serve the necessary assets for the desired user experience. So let's say a user is visiting your product landing page. We shouldn't be sending bundle.js file that includes all of your app. That's irrelevant to them. They might never sign up. So we should make the user experience optimal. We shouldn't be universally set serving code that only caters to legacy browsers, to bleeding edge browsers, the latest browsers. We shouldn't be doing that. We should only serve the code that's necessary for, for the context that is relevant to the user. And this can be done with Webpack, one of the most popular module bundlers that comes with code splitting support. So most straightforward code splitting would look somehow like showing contact, using contact.js bundle only for contact page, home JS only for the landing page, app JS only for the application specific code. It has many other advanced options such as the dynamic imports or lazy loading that you can leverage to create even better and faster user experiences. And because I like to be controversial, we do know that JavaScript is on the rise. Like it becomes very obvious. Everyone loves JavaScript. We love using it. There are some great frameworks. React is growing. It has an amazing ecosystem. And it's really great to be using it. But there are many alternatives. So carefully auditing your architecture choices becomes really important, especially before starting a new project. Do I really need React? Do I really need this other framework? Maybe I can be better off with something else, a more lightweight alternative, such as Preact or Inferno or view. There are many other alternatives out there. We just have to seek them out and think where our requirements are and what's going to be best to do the job. Maybe it means writing more vanilla JavaScript instead. So our performance checklist for JavaScript will be monitoring how much JavaScript is being delivered and how it's parsed and compiled, getting rid of unnecessary dependencies, implementing code splitting, lazy loading, dynamic imports, and considering framework alternatives. So that's all great. We have a lot of tools. We have a lot of strategies to better the user experience of products that we are building. But performance can be really tricky and can be really difficult to track. So it's really necessary to think and track about the long-term results of our tweaks. So here's our checklist that we'll be talking about. User-centric metrics, performance budgeting, monitoring, and building performance awareness. Great performance metrics aim to be as close to the perceived user experience as possible. And I don't really think that long-established metrics such as onload, on-content load, or speeding index do that very well. They talk about delivering the asset, but not the perceived user experience. But fortunately, there are quite a few assets quite a few metrics that we could be using to track performance that are very user-centric at their core, which is first paint, first meaningful paint, visually complete, and time to interactive. And here's the difference between them. So first paint happens when the browser changes from the white background to anything. In this case, it's actually a gray background, but you probably can't tell. Um, first meaningful paint, is when text, imagery, and most major items are visible. Visually complete, all content is ready and visible. And time to interactive that isn't portrayed here is all content is visible, 
and there is no major main thread JavaScript activity, which means if the app is JavaScript heavy, it can be interacted with. So these timings directly correlate to what the user is experiencing and seeing, which makes them such a great candidate for tracking performance. So if it's possible, track all of those metrics. If you're not quite able to, at least pick one of them or two of them and see how you go. But metrics can easily become confusing and cumbersome to understand, especially to people who are non-technical. So without actionable goals and targets, it's really easy to lose track of what we're actually trying to achieve. A few years ago, Tim Cadillac wrote an article about the concept of performance budgets. And performance budgets can be extremely valuable, but unfortunately there's no magical formula that will tell you, well, these, these are your budgets and this is how you calculate them. There's no such thing. It's usually based off competitive analysis of businesses that are competing with you, weird math, um, or goals that are unique to your business. But I think what's really important with setting performance budgets is that you have to aim for a noticeable difference. And I think usually that's 20% difference to be noticed. Experiment and iterate on your budget. Use tools like Performance Budget IO or Calories that can split budgets between your assets and try to figure out where can I make improvements. Track those budgets and see how you go. Monitoring performance shouldn't be manual. Fortunately, there are quite a few tools that will help us with monitoring performance in a continuous way that's kind of out of sight, and we can always log in and see how we're doing. One of those tools is something that I've already mentioned, which is Google Lighthouse, which is an open source project by the Google Chrome DevRel team, um, which will let you auditing performance, accessibility, progressive web apps, and many more. As of very recently, it's in Chrome Stable in DevTools, and you can run it against your site and get a report how well you're doing on progressive web apps, performance, and accessibility. It's really easy under Audits tab in Chrome DevTools. And you can also use it in command line for npm install Lighthouse. If you would like to use continuous performance monitoring, you can use Caliber, where you can set performance budgets, you can use device emulation, distributed monitoring from different locations, and many other features that, honestly, you can't really find elsewhere unless you're ready to sit down and spend your time building a performance suit. And trust me, it's very difficult. Wherever you're tracking, you should make sure that the data is transparent and accessible to the entire team. In a smaller organization, the entire business. Performance is a shared responsibility and spans further than development teams. We're all accountable for what we're building. We're all accountable for the user experience that we're creating. It doesn't matter what our role is. It doesn't matter what our title is. So it's incredibly important to advocate for performance and establish collaboration processes for performance, even as early as product decisions or design phases to pinpoint those possible performance bottlenecks that could come up later. Caring about performance is not a business goal. It's about fundamental empathy and putting the best interest of people first. This is our job. This is not a business goal. But if you really have to make it about sales and stats because you cannot sell it to the business that you're working at, use PWA stats to look up some amazing statistics about how performance improves sales and user experience, if you absolutely have to. So what I would like to leave you with is that as technologists, it's our responsibility not to hijack attention and time. It's our objective to build tools that are conscious of human time and human focus. So all of those tools that I mentioned, sure, they're great, and I hope that you will use them on a day-to-day -day basis, and I hope you really got something out of that. But what I want you to remember is that I want you to build a better, more mindful future for all of us with empathy in mind. Thank you. Oh, shit, so hard.
Thank you very much. I learned an awful lot there. I completely um, forgot we were doing questions, okay. Yeah, so, um, well, really fortunately you. for you, the app's fucked by the look of it, so... <laughs> Did anyone actually use the app to I submit a question? I can't even see anything, so I don't know. You will have to shout the questions, or... Did you use the app to submit? Uh, no, but, but you've got a question honest. anyway, okay. Good, because I can see, see you. Because you're right here, so I can just go like <laughs> Try to make the choppies. Uh, so on the web compressioning with the uh, um, Unicode oh. subsetting, yeah. you're actually modifying the, the font files. And it's like... I know with other assets, that sometimes you don't have the legal right to actually modify the binaries that you receive, right. so if you buy or rent the fonts, do you have any knowledge about how the situation is in these things? Yeah, I wish I had the actual explicit answer to this question. I would assume that it's legal to subset because you purchase the entire font, like the right to the font to serve it as a web font. Therefore, serving a subset is within your legal rights as per terms of service, but I think it's something that should be checked within the terms of service. I actually never used Unicode subsetting because I never had a use case for it. So I can't give you an explicit answer. But I, I would assume it's by the license to do so because you purchased the whole set, therefore subsetting it is still the same asset. You'd hope, but like licensing is weird, isn't it? Yeah, I know, <laughs> I would hope. Yeah, it's probably fine. There's a question probably there. Fine. Oh, okay, right, great. Wait, hold on. Wait for the microphone. No one can hear. Quick question. Like, these tools you just represented at the end, oh, yeah. how intrusive are uh, to m measure performance? Because so far, every time we're trying to measure performance in the browsers, the tools themselves, they create some performance problems. They add some performance uh, issues. So you mean the tools, tools themselves and then when you measure the the thing it's not exactly what's happening it's also the added up uh, performance cost added by the tools users itself because usually you don't have more than uh, one thread to run uh, javascript this was happening at least the very early days we were trying to measure performance of javascript running so can we really trust them so you mean you were using a tool that requires you to put on a snippet of code, like a JavaScript tracker? To yeah, we used to do this. Like we also, we, we all know how difficult it is to measure performance for yeah. JavaScript functions with time and things like this, because you only have one thread. So one thread takes the, the time to do this. So how do you, how can you, how, how much can we trust these ones? Are these, how different are, are these tools from what we were doing before? Yeah, so Lighthouse is in DevTools, therefore, it doesn't include anything in your projects because you run it in DevTools. So it's just based on whatever's in the browser. And Calibre doesn't require you to put any tracking code into your projects. It hits your website. Um, whatever, whatever URL you point it to, it will hit it, but it doesn't require any trackers. So there's no performance footprint of using that tool. I don't personally like adding more tools and more trackers, so I don't I wouldn't recommend, unless there was a really great tool, I wouldn't recommend adding anything. So these tools won't add anything to like the payload or they won't add more JavaScript. They're completely independent. They will, they will hit your website, but whether you use it on DevTools or whether you use Calibre, they will be completely independent. So there is no like privacy concerns there. Uh, so the question was, what if the site is not uh, exposed publicly? I think Lighthouse, because it's in DevTools, you can you can run it whenever. In Calibre, you can um, set cookies, or um, yeah, there are settings for you to be able to auth into it. So you can monitor things that are behind login. So to recap, I think with Calibre and Lighthouse, it's not a problem anyway. Probably no. avoid ones where when you're measuring JavaScript, you use a library even larger <laughs> made out of JavaScript <laughs> as well. It's kind of thing. Cool, uh, any more questions? Is it oh. <laughs> no, no. Oh, nice. Okay. This on? Hello? Hi. Um, so you mentioned tools about like content distribution networks um, for images. Yep. Uh, just yesterday, ImageX had an outage, and I was wondering how you would address avoiding putting all your images in one basket or all your eggs in one basket, something like right. that. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess you can... You can look at those tools and those, those alternatives because they're more than ImageX or Cloudinary, and you can, 
you know, assess how reliable they are. I personally can't guarantee how re reliable they will be. I guess if they fall down, then your assets are down because that's how it works. Like you, you've taken the complexity out of your project and given it to a provider, but then the provider falls down and then it's on you. So I don't, I don't have any fallback for you in my but I think it's about picking the right provider um, for your project and the most reliable one. I thought these were really great, especially based on the features that they offer, such as things like facial recognition, um, watermarking things that are very specific to sites that are very image heavy or like they sell assets. Like I've seen those, pr um, those products being very helpful and very successful. Um, but I guess there's always a pit, like a point of failure. Like if you're relying on external tools, there's always a chance that it will fall down and it will cause you trouble. Even I, Amazon, even yeah, even Amazon. Like I'm, Amazon is so reliable. Oops, <laughs> out again. Um, I wish I had a recipe for you to follow. I don't, but I'm certain there's someone who has figured it out. Like how? Like is there a reliant way of like creating a fallback for? Um, for that. I mean, if you're using ImageX with um, source set or picture, you can always create a fallback that's just not dynamic, so not coming from them. And then at least you have some kind of fallback that just comes from your code base. That could be a thing to consider, because in that case, it might be like not the best image, not the best bandwidth, but at least there's an image, which could be important for image-heavy websites like Pinterest. Um, I know it's not the best answer, but I did the best I could. So I guess um, you have the same problems with image CDNs as you would any other kind of CDN. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, yeah, if you're, if you're outsourcing work to other services, you have to assume that something might go wrong. Yeah. Um, any more questions before we go? Don't see anyone. I just, w oh, s sorry, Jeremy. Uh, no pressure. <laughs> so you, you went through a couple of different uh, types of assets. There was. Uh, uh, images, fonts, JavaScript. If someone was just starting out, uh, how would you order those three? Like, where should I start? Where should I go next? What should be last? I thought you were about to ask about CSS. I'm like, I prepped for this one, but it's not that. Um, it depends. I mean, it obviously depends like what you're working on. Like, is it an app at work that's like very JavaScript heavy, or is it your personal site? Like your decisions will be very different based on that. Uh, and it depends on, like, are you a designer or are you a developer? If you're a developer, you can probably focus on JavaScript performance or, yeah, JavaScript performance or web phone performance. But if you're a designer, probably art direction and imagery will be your thing. But that will be the easiest for you to work with. Um, so I think it depends on context and background and what kind of project you will, um, you will be working on. In terms of how advanced those techniques are, I think JavaScript performance is incredibly complex. Uh, I think understanding parse and compile is like another level and trying to split bundles and serve JavaScript conditionally, you have to really know Webpack well and we know that Webpack gets pretty com complex. Um, so I think JavaScript performance is like another level, but web fonts and imagery is fairly straightforward. And especially with imagery, like you can pick the right format, you can run it through some tools and bam, you're done. Like that's really straightforward and beginner friendly, I think. JavaScript, I would say mid to senior level. Web fonts are fairly straightforward as well. So I guess images, web fonts, and then JavaScript as the most complex one. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, any more questions? No, okay, I think I'm going to just um, tie things up. Something I noticed the other day, or, or rather someone else noticed and then posted it on Twitter and then it came to my attention, so I'm not taking credit for it, was that Taylor Swift's website uh, currently is just a black page with nothing on it and it doesn't do anything. And they said, but check out how much code is being used to render this. And I had a look in DevTools and it was 300K. And then I realized I had privacy badger on. <laughs> And so when I actually let everything come for, including all of the ad trackers and everything, it was more like one megabyte. Um, so I figured um, between all of us, we could probably pitch a new website to uh, Taylor Swift, which is not just a black screen, but is also simultaneously about a tenth of the size. And with some of the tips that Carolina has taught us, probably even smaller than that. <laughs> just a thought, you know, an idle thought. Um, but in any case, I think that ties up 
this first fantastic talk, um, which means it's lunchtime, unless I've completely screwed up the schedule. Uh, and we're probably leaving a little bit early for lunch. Great, you can get in before the people downstairs, hopefully. So, um, <laughs> so... Uh,